Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Mega Man Battle Network Operate Star Force. In the last part, we wrapped up the reason this is called Operate Star Force. You can even still see Geo on the bottom right and on the overlay. And now it's time for us to go back to the original game, sort of. I actually said that we were getting towards Endgame last part, and that's technically true. Uh, however, I completely forgot about a minor scenario before the major scenario. Whoops. Before we get into plot wholesale, though... It's time for us to do some Navi chip grinding. As at this point in the game, we can now fight higher versions of damn near every NPC owned Navi fight in the game that we fought thus far. Number Man, Shark Man, Ice Man, all of them really. So we're gonna be taking some time to go ahead and do all of that before we do anything else. By and large, for instance, Number Man 3, as you can tell, still pretty straightforward. But the annoying thing about doing all this is, yes, I can get the V3 chip, but then I need to face them but do worse so I can get the V2 chip. At least in some cases. I think I do wait on some of them until later, but if you're being smart, I'd recommend just getting them all out of the way now because that'll just save you time later in the case you're going for 100% like I am. Admittedly, I do kind of wish they gave you better warning as to when you could refight certain earlier boss fights like that, like just sending Land an email or something. But I imagine that would have just kind of cluttered the mailbox in game. Oh, speaking of which, what do we got? Aura virus. I ran into a virus with some kind of aura the other day. Damage less than the number it displays doesn't hurt it. It looks like you need really high power chips for this guy. When it attacks, part of it comes outside the aura. Maybe aiming for that with a buster would work? Everybody, watch out and good luck. That is, of course, talking about the Megalian virus that we ran into starting, uh, I think, three or four parts ago now, ish. Somewhere in that vicinity. And now time for more Navi refights. I would say, by and large, if you're playing the game casually and you don't care to just go after 100% and get every Navi chip and all that, I'd say at the most to refight Gutsman for the obvious program advanced stuff. And Sharkman, because his battleships get absolutely ridiculous. Everything else you can probably by and large ignore and you'll be fine. Partially just due to Battle Network 1's difficulty curve being relatively... Not steep. What's the opposite of steep? Shallow, I guess? Because there, there's not much of a big jump in this game's difficulty curve. There's that one point you need to have a certain amount of HP memories and power-ups in order to actually beat the game. But otherwise, you don't need to worry too much. With that said, it's time for Sharkman V2 in particular. And being a V2 fight, we're seeing this one at normal speed. This is where you really get to see just how annoying, uh, moving forward, the fins can be on this fight. It's also a good example of how if you have a program advanced right off the bat, you don't have to worry too much about him because you can just hit him the once, stun him where he is, and then just thwack him with your face. Now, the reason I would recommend doing Sharkman like I just did earlier, you know, I more so recommend V3 than V2, for obvious reasons, because you can get the V3 and V2 chips from that, is Sharkman's battle chip is absolutely ridiculous. For one thing, it's S-code, which means it codes well with a lot of the sword type and really powerful chips, like the, I think, uh, Dino Wave chips do? One of those. And what it does is that it sends Sharkman's fins across the entire road doing the amount of damage it says on the tin. I think it can also pierce through enemies hitting multiple, if there are any on the same row, which isn't the most common occurrence, but oh well. Because of this, it's one of the best chips for damage coverage in the game. It's like if Fireman, I think, did slightly less damage in every incarnation, but could hit everything. It's absurd. And in some cases in the original Battle Network 1, it's the only way you can get some of the best chips in the game because of how strict the requirements are to obtain them via the high busting ranks. Sharkman S and its cousins later down the road, phenomenal. Absolutely worth your time. And any kind of annoyance you might have trying to get V3 uh, from the third fight, because oh boy, Sharkman 3 is a nightmare. With that said, while we're here, let's go fight Iceman as well, take care of some stuff with that. I could have potentially sparsed these out better, but I figure it's just probably better to get them all done now while you can in case you like some of these battle chips and want to get them. Admittedly, the 
saving grace slightly about the series is that chip grinding is an important thing throughout for 100%, yes. But the worst games to chip grind in are technically the first two in the series. Because Battle Network 3 Beyond has ways to make the chip grind easier on you, between the sub-chips they give you as well as a certain Navicust program, making it a lot easier to get battle chips over Zenny and vice versa. With that said, there's some cases where it's still annoying from then on, just due to how, for instance, 4 and 5 handle their viruses. But that's just because of poor structuring in those latter games. The series is so weird to look at from a retrospective angle because they hit a really tight curve in 2 and 3, had a gap of thought with Battle Network 4's choices, started back on the right track for 5, and then nailed 6 completely. 6 is probably the overall tightest game in the series, mechanically. Because there's nothing that really feels unneeded or extra in that one. Whereas I could definitely say there's parts of 3 that feel a bit too extra for their own good and stuff. Now, this particular NPC I actually could have talked to earlier, I believe. Uh, apparently this vending machine's having problems, so we can jack into it and do another completely unmarked side quest that this game loves to do oh so much. Just make sure to save because you'll be fighting some new viruses here. What are you doing there? Now that you've seen me here, I must delete you. We have two new viruses in this fight. A Hardhead 3, no this is a Hardhead 2 actually, and a Flow Shell 2. Uh, the Hardhead 2 is the exact same as Hardhead 1's we saw back in Internet 2. Except they have 70 HP, 30 damage, and I think they attack more quickly. Flow Shells are defensive viruses. They're covered with a shield for most of the fight. Which you can either just aim behind using things that attack two panels, or you can charge attack it or hit it with a strong enough attack that it'll just bounce the shield up and then you can start attacking them outright. They're defensive and their only attack otherwise is to randomly spread bombs over your field, usually three at a time I believe, that you can't exactly easily predict where they're going to go. And that's the side quest, once we talk to him it's done. Thanks, I got my cola. This brand is only in this machine. I can't work without it. <laughs> Take this for your trouble. The Repair G isn't the most useful. I think that might be used in a program advance. Maybe there is a repair chip used in a program advance. I can't remember which one it is. Chad, he went to Dentown. He said that he heard of the World 3 members there. His job? Well, but he's supposed to find World 3's address. That's why he's looking for members, I guess. Cool. That's also the main reason we're here at the... Government Complex. That's the name of this place. Because we were supposed to come here to meet Chad, at least according to Dad, but he's not here, so guess we're out of luck. Also notably, if you come down to the restaurant at this point in the game, we have some new NPCs down here. My girlfriend said she wants cute chips. All I have is this wood or a C. She'll get mad if I give her this. I don't suppose you'd trade this chip for an Invis 2J Big Clad K and Raton 3L? Please. Now that seems like an extraneous amount of work. Three chips for one? Yes and no, because that is a lot of work for that one chip, because some of those aren't exactly the most common codes of those exact chips. But the wood aura chip itself, which is dropped by, I think, the third variant of the Megalian, is damn near pixel frame perfect to get otherwise with manipulations. It's absurdly hard to get, so that is the best way to get that chip. Outside of technically using the chip trader, but again, that's more RNG manipulation that I don't know how to do and do not feel like doing on recording because that's a lot of effort for low returns. If you're a World 3 member, then you know about the Undernet. Tell me, now. I said I don't know anything about World 3. Ugh, another false lead. How will I get into the Undernet? Huh, you again. I'm busy here. Leave me alone. What's your problem? I heard you were having problems, so I just came to help. Why would I ever need your help? Out of my way. What a jerk. Hey, Lan. Yeah. I don't want to help Chad, but we have to stop the endgame. Mega Man, let's try to find the World 3 server's address. Okay, first we'll need to get into the internet. Chan just said that any World 3 member should know how. Well, we happen to know a World 3 member, don't we? Before we head on back to a certain shop, though. 
Uh, at this point, Skullman 3 is also available to fight, so let's make sure we go ahead and do that and get one of his two battle chips. Skullman might be my favorite Net Navi to just kind of go into the game and fight. I don't know why. Maybe it's the fact I like his design and he's relatively underutilized. I remember loving the manga chapter that he was from. Uh, mostly because Lan just jumps out of a bus to try and save Mega Man. You know what? I appreciate that kind of appreciation for your homies. I haven't really talked too much about the manga in this LP, have I? Uh, the Mega Man Battle Network manga is an old favorite of mine, partially because it was the first manga I ever read. My mom used to work at a Borders here in the States, and she brought me the first one home on a whim because she knew I liked Mega Man, and I, I forget if I had seen the uh, the anime at that point or played the games. What I think the manga may have been my first exposure to the series, maybe. And at times it's dark, but it's ultimately a really cool series. Really well done, and I love the art of it especially. Go on, beat it. Land, challenge John to a net battle? At this point, we can now tackle on Proto Man V2. With that said, while he's faster and more agile with his attacks, he's still the same fight we did a few parts ago. In fact, his HP barely boosts. If that's another weird thing about Battle Network 1's difficulty curve, Future variants of boss fights and enemies seldom get a substantial HP boost. It's usually maybe a hundred to two hundred at most. When later games, especially with later game enemies, tend to get upwards of three to four hundred HP boosts depending on the fight. By the end of the series, we'll very often be seeing HP totals upwards of a thousand plus just in a boss fight you can randomly encounter. It's it gets rough. But at the same time, they scale up the damage you can do, potentially, with program advances and other mechanics anyway, so they at least keep it consistent, I suppose, is the way I want to phrase it. You can deal with it pretty comfortably, as long as you're customizing your folder regularly and smartly. But for beating Proto Man, we're going to get his own Proto Man chip coded B for blues. I didn't make any mistakes. What's in that Navi there? Proto Man's pretty straightforward. He homes in on the nearest enemy and then uses a higher damage wide sword on them. With that said, it's still pretty good because A, it's B code, which codes off a lot of endgame stuff. And B, uh, I believe it's part of a pretty notable program advance. I want to say it is. I might be thinking of a different chip, but I think I have it right. I might be thinking of a later game here, honestly, because... Since BN1 and its DS Remake don't have a program advance memo, I can't exactly recall what chips I need for what program advances because it never tracks it. Either way, hi, Higsby. You want inside the internet, huh? Okay, huh? Thanks to you, I got a World 3, huh? But thank you, I'll get you into the internet, huh? I sent the codes to your PET, huh? Eh, yeah, but that would get a Higsby memo. Head towards Dentown in the net, huh? The access point's there. Use the code on that memo, huh? That'll get you in. Uh huh? Alright, so technically at this point, we can progress on with plot, but there's a little more we can do just to help smooth things over. The most we have to do for right now is just head to Internet 4, though, because in order to do the next couple steps, in the correct order, we need to unlock the Internet first. It looks like an access point to somewhere. Mega Man! I'll bet that's the access point to the internet. I think so too. I'll try using Higsby's memo. Mega Man used Higgs memo. The access route to the internet opened. All right. Yeah. Uh-huh. What's wrong? Lan, it's a virus and a big one at that. Oh man, this could be bad. Well, only one thing to do now. Battle routine set. Execute. Another proper mini boss against a Flow Shell 3 and Hardhead 3s. This is notably the only place you fight Flow Shell 3s, by the way. And uh, the Flow Shell line does have a battle chip, but it's only dropped by the first variant. Flow Shell 3 has 250 HP and does 40 damage. Hardhead 3 has 80 HP and 30 damage. Again, both of these viruses are only encountered here, though, so no battle chips to worry about. It's just a kill them before it kills you sort of scenario. The annoying thing about this particular variant is Flow Shell 3s drop like 5 bombs at once and the Hardhead 3s do attack pretty quickly, so it's a pretty relentless onslaught against you if you're not prepared. 
land. I made it into the undernet. It, it looks like you got some mail. Well, let's take a look at that. Land, the world three servers hidden deep down inside the undernet. There are three locks, each a higher level than the last, okay? Unfortunately, I don't have any idea how to open them. But one of my old World 3 friends is at the Scilab now. He regrets having worked for World 3 now, and he might help you. Essentially, the first portion of the Undernet, 1 through 4, are just a straight shot. Uh, unlike Undernet 5 or so, where we were at much earlier in the game, that was Internet Area 9 in the original game. And in order to progress through each area, you need more and more keys from World 3 members. Hmm, hmm, hmm? Me, a World 3 member? You must be joking. Huh? Higsby said what? I see. Now I get the picture. Use this. It should clear things up. Many people like Higgs and myself quit World 3. There are two more locks to open to get to the server. Find two more members from others who have quit World 3. However, you'll have to be strong enough to defeat World 3. Even with the memos approaching the server, before you're strong enough, we'll just end up getting you in danger. In Density, there are two more members. A young, beautiful lady, and an old man. And those are the only hints we have to go off of. And this is where the game will level gate you slightly if you haven't been doing enough throughout it. Because in order to progress through the game, you're gonna need at least 60 chips marked in your library and have Mega Man be at least level 30 on the Mega Man screen which has gotten through power-ups and the like. Our summer school teacher is normally quite cheerful, but lately she seems to be a bit gloomy sometimes. Talking to people, I think, is the only hints you can get to find out who to find. Me, an ex-member of World 3. Huh. <laughs> hmm. Let me see that nappy of yours. Ha. <laughs> I've been waiting for a net battler like you to appear. I've been playing the fool to hide from World 3. Sure, I know how to undo some blocks. Hmm. Let me check your data library. I suppose that you're ready now. Here's how to open the lock. I have faith you can stop World 3. <laughs> uh, oops, uh, uh, looks like that's become a habit. Miss Yuri being a World 3 member in some regards actually got brought into the anime eventually where she got a completely unique design. Uh, but that was season two, which was where that series started to get a little weird. You think I'm the next member of World 3, huh? Mm -hmm. Let me see that Navi you've got there. Well, no point in pretending to be senile anymore. Yes, I was a member at the beginning. As Wily's assistant! Yeah, I know how to release the internet lock, but... Let me see that Navi of yours one more time. Well, I guess that you may be strong enough now. Here. Perhaps the one to stop the endgame will be you, Lam. Not a Scilab or official net battler. Again, you need to have 60 chips in your library at a minimum and be at least level 30 on the Mega Man screen, which might well, take some grinding if you haven't been buying HP memories throughout the game and the power-ups. But if you've been healthy about fighting things, you'll probably get through just fine. At this point, though, I'm going to start heading back towards the internet through Miu's comp because it's the shortest shortcut here. But we do have a new enemy along the way, the starter can devil enemy. 160 HP, 100 damage, and they can drop the Candle 1 battle chip. Uh, starting, I believe, from rank 7? And again, that just heals you. It's a bit of an odd one. I'm not the biggest fi fan of the Can Double line anyway, because I think they're pretty hard to fight, especially in some of the cases in Battle Network 2. But, hey, I'm going to need them for 100% anyway, and it, this brings us right to where I need to be. Also, I forget if I mentioned it already. I forget if I did, but that... Net merchant in the undernet we already encountered. Uh, I say that because I'm running into this guy and he had an armor in the original game. That one net merchant in the undernet uh, that we ran into on the one split path, and I think it was technically internet area 10 in the original game, that's where you get the final armor in the game. Now, unlike the other portions of the undernet we've already been to, you don't have to worry about getting to the end of these areas fulfilling a certain criterion. You just need to reach the end of them and you'll be allowed to progress. But there are still some new viruses to worry about around here, though not too many compared to other areas. For instance, we got the third and final B-Tank variant here. B-Tank 3 is 150 HP, 140 damage. They're the most annoying B-Tank, as not only are they the fastest, but their attack covers a full 3x3 three three grid. So in order to make sure you don't get hit by them, you need to be on any of the extremes of your uh, side of the field to not get hit. Or have area steel on hand, on standby. Either or is preferable. 
Now you might notice up there on the top of the map, there's two exits from Undernet 1. One leads to Undernet 2 where we need to go for plot, the other leads back to the first area of the Undernet we explored when we were doing some exploration earlier, Undernet uh, 5 I believe. Uh, the place where we fought Color Man V2 in particular. And if you try to go through there now, you don't have to worry about it because I already have the Higsby memos. But if you try to go through there without exploring certain parts of the game first, it's a one-way street. I believe in particular it's if you try to go to Internet, uh, to Undernet 1 through Undernet 5 that that happens, I think. Bottom line, at this point in the game already, I believe. I don't have to worry about that. Also, something I forgot to mention about future Metar varieties, Metar 2 in particular on. Uh, ooh, there's the guy on one ship. Uh, Metar 2 is beyond. They shield themselves beneath their helmets. Uh, when they're not the one that's actively trying to attack you. And that means you can only theoretically damage one at once. Uh, later games will add a break element to break through their helmets as it is, period. But if you catch two of them on the same row in the period after one just finished attacking and the others get out, getting out of their helmet to attack you, you can hit them both at once and not have to worry about that. Whether or not that was intentional to start, I'm not sure, but it definitely was memorable enough that they kept it in the future games and I'll, I'll take it. It makes getting Dynawave chips really easy and I love that chip line in basically every game it appears in. Those World 3 jerks have set it up so that you can't get back through there. Once you go through there, you can't get back. Sheesh. So, as I mentioned, we can now access Undernet 5 pretty quickly, but you can only go back through that shortcut if you have the Scilab memo at the least that we got from that scientist guy a few minutes ago. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part 19, we're heading into further portions of the Undernet that are not as further portion as we've already further portioned, <laughs> so to speak. See you guys then. As soon as I use the Scilab memo, there we go, I timed that a little poorly, but oh well, goodbye!